Right. We're back on air. Welcome to episode five of Once Upon a Time in the Ashes, the podcast that tells the stories of the unsung heroes of the Ashes, those cricketers who played in only one Ashes test. Rob, the further days in the Australian and English sun, whether through doubtful bowling actions, the whim of the selectors, or inopportune injuries. Last time out, the focus was on the 1965 to 66 Ashes in Australia that yielded three of our 45 living cricketers who graced the Ashes arena on a solitary occasion. David Sincock, Eric Russell and Peter Allen. We're now going to jump to 1968, a year of rebellion, unrest and assassinations. Cricket wasn't immune to the upheaval. The year started with a riot at Kingston during England's tour of the West Indies, more of that soon, but that was nothing compared to the simmering political and sporting controversy that eventually overshadowed the ashes and boiled over into what is simply known now as the Dolivera Affair. Amid the chaos, three more cricketers were to make their cameo ashes appearance. Brian Tabor and Roger Pridow's stories will follow in the next two episodes and we'll explore the Dolivera Affair in more detail. Today, our focus is Pat Pocock of Surrey, our most capped one ashes test wonder, He would make his test debut and Ashes debut in 1968 and so is handily placed to guide us through this tumultuous year. And that's before we've even started on Fred's toes. Penny Cowdery, Colin's wife, was on a one-man boat and Fred went up to the boat and he thought the propeller was at the back of the boat and it wasn't apparently, It it was in the middle of the boat and his legs went under the boat and suddenly woof, off went all the toes. Before all of that, we've got time to delve into the Ashes archive to find an attacking batsman who played his one Ashes test in 1947 and toured with Bradman's Invincibles in 1948. Ron Hammonds of West Torrens Cricket Club and South Australia was born in the Adelaide suburb of Hindmarsh in 1915. He served in the Royal Australian Air Force for four years during the Second World War and played three tests in total for Australia. Dennis Bryan, former player and president of West Torrens Cricket Club in Adelaide, started research in the famous old club in the 1990s. I started visiting some of the old players from the club and I got to know them quite well. And uh, Ron was the only test player of those. I wrote a history of the club from 1897 to 1997 when it was called West Torrens. But I went to interview Ron and he said... What in the hell do you want to interview me for? I'm nobody. <laughs> uh, you know, that was his attitude to life. We got to know each other quite well, and he'd go around at half past ten in the morning and open a beer for you. He was just a down-to-earth character. Ron made a century on his first-class debut for South Australia against Tasmania in March 1936. Clearly a man for the big occasion, his next century came against Queensland on Christmas Day 1936. He completed the 1940-41 to season and then the Second World War meant his next first-class match wasn't until December 1945. But it was the following season, an Ashes season, when he put himself in the running for Test selection with three consecutive centuries for South Australia at the end of 1946. He then really had the chance to put himself in the shop window in the game against the MCC in January 47. The MCC made 577, Wally Hammond top scoring with 188. Doug Wright then took the wickets of Reginald Craig and Bradman, and South Australia were floundering at 26 for two. Could Ron succeed where the Don had failed? Emphatically yes, as he plundered 145 and put on 200 with opener Phil Ridings. The selectors were impressed and he was selected for the fifth and final test of the series, at the SCG, when an injury to Ian Johnson provided an opening. And again, Ron came to the crease, with Bradman out cheaply to Doug Wright. In his only Ashes test, so he went in and Australia were 4 for 187, but they had overnight rain and they were really on a sticky, and no one could handle Wright. He got 7 for, and he bowled with three slips. But he could handle him, and he got 30 not out. 
Well, he tried to farm the strike, I think, and, and Toshak got run out at the end. I know Wright got him out in the second innings. But I think in England, against Wright and Jack Young and the last test, Hollies, I think he would have handled them very well. The following summer, Ron played two more test matches, this time against India. He was picked in the second test and he got 25. And Australia didn't bat in the second innings. Uh, third test, he got 25. And they didn't bat in the second innings again. Then they dropped him for Harvey. In the fifth test, Harvey got 100. Ron went back to Shield cricket, scored some more runs for South Australia, and he did enough to ensure he was on the boat to England for the 1948 Ashes. And it was a quiet trip over, by all accounts. On the way to England in 48, uh, he and Hassett and Ring used to, at late at night, they'd have a few beers and then get into Hammett's cabin and sing. And then they used to bang on Bradman's door and say, how would you like that one, George? Was he taking liberties with the Australian captain? Ron had form with the famous teetotaler at South Australia. The SACA gave them, at the end of the game, 12 long necks of beer, one per player. And he always got there on the last day early to get a locker alongside Bradman. At the end of the day, they were passed around and he said, OK, Georgia, you won't be needing yours, I'll have yours, thanks. On tour in England, Ron couldn't break into the test side to add to his solitary Ashes appearance. See, he lost five years of first-class cricket uh, through war service. And when he went to England in '48, he was surprised because he was 33. Two people vying for this, the sixth specialist batsman spot were him and Harvey. Now, Harvey was 19. So he, he said he could understand why they would choose Harvey in the tests. So he wasn't bitter at all about it. But given the chance, he proved he could score runs in England. Well, his best was 99 against Somerset down at Taunton. Bradman actually called people who, out of the change rooms who were playing cards and said, come and watch this. You won't see much like this uh, any other time because he, he was batting so beautifully. Unfortunately, he was promptly stumped by Wally Lux off the bone of Somerset's occasional leg spinner, Miles Coop. Dennis can give us an insight into his batting that might provide a clue as to how he got out that day. He was an attacking player, particularly against the slows. He, uh, he just loved to go down the track. He was to enjoy one final day in the sun against the Poms in October 1950 in his final ever first-class match. He got 100 in against the MCC, against Freddie Brown's team, and retired after that game. He was pretty chuffed with that to to have made 100 in his first first-class game and 100 in his last first-class game. Ron scored 114 in that match. And how was he out? Stumped by Godfrey Evans off the bowling of Freddie Evans. No doubt bowling his leg breaks that day. But what about a match-up against the ultimate leggy? But one of our old players, well, old players, he's about 85 now, former president, who played a few games with him, and he said... A very good tussle would be to watch Hammonds against Warren. At, at the time Warren came on the scene, Ron would have been about 92. I like to think that Ron would still have danced down the track to Shane Warren, even at the ripe old age of 92. But now it's time to turn our attention from a leggy to an offy. Let's move on to today's guest, the Surrey and England star Pat Pocock. Pat had an incredible first-class career that spanned 22 years from 1964 to 1986. He took a mind-boggling 1,607 wickets from 554 first-class matches with 60 fifers. He took 10 wickets in a match on seven occasions. There were 17 years between his England Test debut in 1968 in Bridgetown and his final Test appearance in India in 1985. His solitary Ashes test was at Old Trafford in 1968. He was capped 25 times and took 67 wickets. Pat, welcome to Once Upon a Time in the Ashes. I saw a quote from John Woodcock who said that the three people in the world who enjoyed the game of cricket the most were Derek Randall, Gary Sobers and yourself. Was this the key to your longevity and consistency? I think I... 
I was always very, very grateful to be playing cricket for a living and I just loved every minute of it and although nobody wants to have any bad times even the bad times were good as the expression goes. Okay let's take you back to the start of your county career you played for Surrey for 22 years what are your memories of starting out with them? There are lots of very fine players and experienced players. When you got the likes of Mickey Stewart and Kim Barrington and Bernie Constable, 25 years Bernie played for. So there was an awful lot of experience around. And Arthur McIntyre, the coach, the wicketkeeper batsman who played for England and was the coach for a long time at Surrey, he asked me to go in for a trial. And I went in when I was playing for Surrey schools against Essex schools at the Oval went in for a trial and then they offered me a contract and <laughs> a very small one I might tell you. <laughs> was it always your dream as a youngster to play professional cricket? I didn't I didn't get through the 11 plus but I passed what we had then the 13 plus and I went to a technical college and they said to me what do you want to do when you leave school? So I said I want to play cricket. They said yes I know that but what do you want to do for a living? I said I want to play cricket and they they rather shook their head. They couldn't believe that I was that I was at a technical college where they taught engineers and architects and this sort of thing. And, and I just kept on saying, I just want to play cricket. And I uh, turned pro age 16 and I was very grateful for it. As you say, you were very young when you joined Surrey. Did you have a backup plan at all? I think if I'd have gone in five or six years later, I would have had a backup plan. But no, I just went in and played and uh, wanted to do the best the best I could there. And then fortunately, a couple of years later, when I'm 19, I get picked to go with the England under 25 side to Pakistan to play under Mike Brearley with the rest of the England under 25 players. And we had a great tour. It was a great experience. And we, and we had what I found out to be a fantastic side. And the interesting thing about that is it was an under 25 side. And when you're up country in Pakistan, there's not a lot going on. So you spend a lot talking about cricket. And we all thought that if we'd been allowed to play as a county side in the championship, we would have stood a very good chance of winning the championship. A lot of people matured early, you know, the likes of Keith Fletcher, Dennis Amis, Alan Knott, Derek Underwood, Jeff Arnold, myself, David Brown. They matured quite early. I think you might have won the championship most years with a team like that. Do you think going to Pakistan as well, from your own personal point of view as a spinner, was that a good schooling to to play on some of the pitches out there? Oh, yeah. I mean, to play against, they had some wonderful players. And basically the pitches overseas, especially in Lahore, were, were like bowling on a billiard table. It was rock hard and you could hardly get a ball off the straight. On the 25 test matches I played, only five were played in England. All the rest were played overseas. Virtually half of my test matches were played against the West Indies. Well, I can remember my first test match in the West Indies and you looked over the wicket and you could see a reflection coming back up at you again. It was like marble. And so to play against very, very powerful West Indian sides on wickets like that was rather demanding. OK, well, let's have a look at 1968 in more detail. This was the year you made your Ashes appearance but first up was the West Indies. How excited were you to be picked for that tour? Yeah, I thought it was marvellous to follow someone like Fred Titmus, who I thought was a brilliant, brilliant bowler. For me, the best off spinner I have ever seen, a test match off spinner, was Lance Gibbs. But Fred Titmus was the best day in and day out county bowler I ever saw in England. And to go there with him was a great honour. But it certainly wasn't a tour for the faint-hearted. The trouble began in the second test at Kingston, didn't it? Uh, when we were in Jamaica, we had riot squads who ran onto the pitch with tear gas and submachine guns because suddenly the bottles rained down onto the wicket at a decision that the umpire made. And we all had to disappear into the pavilion and wear wet towels over our head because we were getting burnt up with tear gas. And then the police had to chase all the troublemakers out the ground. And, and so we had to come back on the sixth day to make up the time that we lost on that day when we had the riots. I remember the umpire gave Jim, Jim Park in and the crowd thought it was wrong. So they suddenly these bottles were landing on the wicket. And I'll tell you what, 
They've got great arms, some of these West Indian supporters, and the bottles were smashing right on the middle of, on the middle of the wicket. When bang, 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 the tear gas bombs went off, and the wind was blowing in the wrong direction. It blew it all back into uh, the pavilion. You went out as Fred's understudy, and he played in the first two tests, including that one in Jamaica. Did you think you had a realistic chance of playing in one of the five tests? To be fair, I knew that I was always going to be behind Fred. That's when he had all his toes. In the matches before, the President's match and Ireland games, I think I got two or three fivers or sixers. The media were saying, is Pat Pocock going to threaten Fred Titmus? Well, whether I did or not, I don't know. But obviously the, the boating accident rather sorted out the selection. Yes, I think it's time we spoke about Fred's toes. Can you tell us what happened from your perspective? Penny Cowdery, Colin's wife, was on a one-man boat and Fred went up to the boat and he thought the propeller was at the back of the boat and it wasn't apparently, it was in, it was in the middle of the boat and his legs went under the boat and suddenly woof, off went all the toes and he was carried out of the sea. He went to a local hospital where there was a Canadian who had operated on a huge number of ice hockey players who had lost toes in the same way. Whether that helped Fred or not, I don't know. But as you know, he later came back and played again. So perhaps it might have done. I remember people were saying, what's got six toes and spins? (laughs) So and it just seemed like such incredible luck that there was this Canadian surgeon then who, as you say, specialised in these ice hockey injuries. And he'd probably seen severed toes and all the rest of it but yeah. it must have been a huge shock to the to the rest of the squad i mean what was the feeling amongst the other players oh well, to start off with when you hear that someone loses the toes it's as sad as can be because you don't think he's ever going to play a game and apart from death it's it's about the saddest thing anybody could hear and it's just simply incredible that he then came back and played test cricket for Eng- england again yeah. how did he manage without his toes he had to learn a lot of new things. Uh, he had to learn to walk properly, walk a different way. He had, had padding put in his boots. Fortunately, he, he kept his big toe. Because he kept his big toe, that was the reason why he was able to uh, rehabilitate and to get back into the game again. But of course, this did open up a place for you in the third test. Not, I'm sure, in the way you would have liked. But you were in good form, weren't you? You took 5 for 84 against Barbados. How did you go on your test debut? I got a couple of wickets. Clive Lloyd hit one back at me, which would have killed me, but I just happened to get my hands in the way and I caught it. And that was my first wicket in test cricket. Not a bad one, isn't it? Clive Lloyd. That's pretty good first test wicket. Oh, yeah, I was quite pleased with that. And uh, I think I got Ron Can I out and this sort of thing. But I mean, they had a a fine lineup. You then missed the fourth test, but you returned for the all-important fifth test that England needed to draw to secure the series win in the West Indies. And it was your batting that was to the fore this time, wasn't it? Well, Lockie and I had to bat for an awful long time. The fourth test match, which uh, we drew, Gary Sobers actually made a mistake. He uh, declared, and I think he uh, f- uh, forgot that Charlie Griffith wasn't fit uh, to bowl. And not only could Charlie not bowl, but he used to take an awful long time to, uh, to bowl an over. And so they bowled more overs than they might have done. And we actually knocked off the runs thanks to Boycott and Barrington and Basil D'Oliveira. And so we went in one up to the last test match. And then we had to bat for an awful long time. And I think I, I got 13 runs, I think, but uh, I turned a lot down. But I think I was in for about an hour and a half. And Lockie, Lockie got 80 odd and played really well. And we batted a long time. And in fact, there's quite a good story there. When I get out, I got out as five minutes to go and Jeff Jones the opening bowler comes to bat number 11 and Alan Knott's on 70 and Jeff Jones was a Welshman at the end of the over Notty tried to keep strike but couldn't do it so therefore Jeff Jones had to bat out the last over and they met in the middle of the wicket and we thought what are they saying now what what technical advice is Notty giving giving Jonah and he just went up to Jeff Jones in his ear and he sung, We'll keep a welcome in the hillside. <laughs> and that was it. And, and he, we only found that out, obviously, afterwards uh, when he came in. But Jeff Jones played, uh, played out the maiden. We drew the match and we won the series, which after three and a half months tour, 
and the whole series is going down to the last over. It's a pretty close game, pretty yeah. close tour. Brilliant series and must have been incredible as a, a 21 year old to be involved in that. Tell us briefly about what happened after that final test. I came out of the pavilion afterwards. We were going back to the hotel and I'm with Tony Locke and John Snow. Suddenly a pebble comes over and hits Lockie on the back of the head. And then a stone and a brick. They were rioting and the riot police there on horseback, they charged the crowd who were about a cricket pitch away. We jumped in the car that was sent to take us back to the hotel and they drove along about 150 yards and we came to a corner. We were held up by the numbers of the people. So the three of us slid down into the seat so nobody saw us. And we looked out the window and they were throwing stones and bricks wow. where they thought we were. And we were actually sitting right amongst uh, the rioters. So it's a rather good job they didn't see it. Anyway, the driver put his hand on the horn, drove at the crowd, people dived out the way and we got away unhurt. And we went back to the hotel and of course, as soon as the media heard about this, they were, they were all over us saying what happened is and who did this and who, who did what. And yeah, we got away with it. And then we just had a normal, fairly relaxed evening after mm. knowing that we won the series and we got away without, without anyone being injured. But an incredibly scary moment, um, it was you know, a scary especially moment. for a junior player like yourself, I imagine. Yeah, and then... <laughs> And uh, that was just the first of many of, the, or first of a few of the, of the scare, the scary moments in the career. After winning the series and surviving the riots, you then come back to England, and the Australians are in town. Are you thinking this is my chance to play in the Ashes? I wasn't counting on anything because I knew there were a lot of good bowlers around. So I thought, well, I'll just wait and see what goes. And and then the first match came along. Old Trafford, uh, the test match, and I was picked for it, yeah. Just looking at the build-up to that test match, there was a match against the Australians at the Oval immediately before the test, which yeah. uh, I don't think you were involved in. You were involved in the game against Warwickshire at the end of May where you took seven wickets, so obviously that showed you were in good form. But was yeah. there any particular reason why you missed the Australian game? Most players will tell you that I was one of the biggest spinners of the ball. Now, when you spin the ball as a finger spinner, you're pretty lucky if you don't rip your finger. So if there was any non-championship match, then I very often I didn't play in it because I wanted to give my finger a rest. Because, it, I mean, I can remember playing one game and it was just dripping, the blood was dripping off the end of my finger on every ball and the umpire had to wipe the blood out the seam. How did you find out that you were selected for that game and... Obviously, you've just been to the West Indies, playing against the fabulous West Indies team. Was the Ashes still a step above that? Obviously, with the likes of Hall and Griffiths and Sobers and Canai and Basil Butcher, one or two others, Seymour Nurse, you knew they were a magnificent side. But at the same time, they didn't have the history that Australia had. So, you know, I was very pleased. In those days, you weren't told anything. You listened to the radio and your name came up on the radio. Uh, it's very rarely where you ever told that you were playing in a match. Sometimes when you were going on a tour, I can remember pulling over in the car and listening to the radio when it comes on to find out I've been selected to go on a tour. So let's get to this first test then. Obviously, you'd made your debut in the West Indies. Did that make it easier coming into the change room? Obviously, a lot of the, the same players were there. I've been around county cricket since I was 17-year-old. So to be fair, there wasn't anybody pointing a finger saying, who's he? I'd had a few good uh, performances. The whole thing really was whether they thought I was suited to the match. And did you gel with anyone in particular in that team? Well, I roomed for three and a half months with Notty, with Alan Not the wicketkeeper. Basil Dolvir, I, was, I spent a lot of time with Basil, and who wasn't one of the younger players, but he went on his first tour to the West Indies, as I did. No, and and don't forget there were quite a few on that tour who I was with in Pakistan with the under with the under twenty five side. So I probably knew or had played with six, five or six players anyway. And let, let's get to um, your own performance in that match, which was mm. which was brilliant. You know, for a twenty one year old taking six for seventy nine in the second innings, that must have been a fantastic feeling to perform so well. 
yeah it's rather funny you said that i wasn't i wasn't really that angry that i wasn't selected for the next test until about 10 years afterwards and then i thought what on earth are they doing trying to bring on a young spinner i bowled 34 overs got six to 79 against a very powerful australian side and they leave me out the next test now i got the bowling award and Basil de Oliveira got the batting award. And we're both sitting on the bench when they take the field, the next test at Lords. And the photographer sticks his head around the door and says, I've got a photograph for you two. And uh, it's us both being presented with the bowling award and, and the batting award of the match. I must say to get left out was, I thought, oh, well, I just accepted it. I didn't, I didn't moan about it. I didn't say anything. I just accepted it. From an outsider's point of view, it does seem strange to discard a young spinner after such an excellent debut. Looking back, how do you explain it? When I was left out, they picked they picked Eric Underwood to play at Lords. Well, I played so much with Derek, for tw- and I know that Derek is a brilliant bowler, two hundred and ninety odd Test wickets, a fantastic bowler, love a lovely bloke. But at that time. He was nowhere near the bowler that he became. Uh, in fact, when he was away in the winter, he used to go into lockdown with Alan Knott, trying to work out where his next wicket was coming from. And I couldn't understand how how they could leave me out and pick unders in those days. I mean, later on, of course they could, because unders developed into a super bowler. Uh, but in that on that test match at Lords, the second test, Anders was nowhere near the bowler that he became. If I'd have gone around the park a bit in the first test, I, I thought, yeah, well, I'm, at least I've played one test against Australia, but to get to do quite well against Kuiper Sheehan, Redpath, Walters, Barry Jarman, Bill Laurie, of course. So I was rather pleased at the result of that, but to get left out for the second one, I can honestly say at the time, I just sort of put my hands up and just accepted it. Okay, and just one other point on that match. You also took the catch to to dismiss the Australian captain in the second innings. What do you remember about that? Yeah, it, I was at mid-wicket. It went up high. It went up very high, and I caught the ball. I was a slow fielder, but uh, I was a very good catcher of the ball, and I used to practice a lot. I actually went five years playing in all forms of cricket, one day as encounter matches without dropping a catch. Colin Cowdery was your captain for the West Indies Tour and, and for, for the Ashes. Did he have faith in you as a bowler? Did you think he ran the team well? Colin was a fabulous player, a lovely man, but very, very easily led. He would listen to and react to the last person he spoke to. Uh, he wasn't the strongest of captains, but it was a pleasure to play under him. There were other senior players in the side who, who had as, at least as much input into the team as he did. Did Colin Cowdery or the selectors offer any explanation as to why you were left out of the next test? He wrote me a letter afterwards and he said, I'm sorry you didn't play. Your time will come. I had a letter from him and John Arlott, etc. That's the sort of thing that Colin would do. He was a very nice man and he was upset when he had to leave anybody out the side. Of the players to only play one Ashes test for England, you have by far the most test appearance in total, 25. Is it really surprising, you know, as we look back on your career now, that you didn't play more tests against Australia? Well, if you pick the, the first test after that one I did play in, it was quite surprising then. If you're not going to pick someone when they've got those sort of figures against that sort of side, you think, well, hang on, when am I going to put? I mean, it was Finn, the, the opening bowler, who played against Australia four years ago. And blow me, he got exactly the same identical figures of six for 79 and he was all over the media and the papers and they wrote him up as though as though he was one of the greatest bowlers in the world and I, and I looked at it with a bit of a wry smile I thought hello I've seen those figures before and mm. um, he, he's written up as a king and a star and I'm left out of the side. Absolutely I mean it's just incredible as I said at the start your last test appearance for England didn't come until 1985 so there were a lot of tours to Australia in between your debut and 1985. Were there any tours in particular no, at the end of a Surrey season? Did you think, I think I'm going to be on this tour to Australia? In 
May, I was actually the leading wicket taker in the country with 27 wickets. And then I had a back injury and I had to have an operation and I didn't play for three months and I played the last four games of the season. Well, by that time, obviously the side to Australia was picked. As I said, I was the leading wicket taker at the time before my back injury. They took three off spinners and I wasn't one of them. A bit peeved at that. Not that I didn't play, but I just thought my sense of timing for a, is the only really injury, only injury apart from a, a finger injury I had in my uh, whole career. And it just happened to coincide with England selecting three off spinners to go to Australia. Yes, that would have been 1982-83 when England took Vic Marks, Eddie Hemmings and Jeff Miller to Australia. Now, we've heard about the riots in the West Indies in 1968 before you played in the Ashes. And there was further trouble on your next tour abroad with England in 1969, wasn't there? We went to Pakistan when they burnt the, uh, the pavilion down and we were inside it. Colin Cowdery's father-in-law died, so he came home and Colin Milburn came out to replace Colin as a batter. And Colin Milburn had been playing in Australia. The students ran the match in Dhaka. Then we went to Karachi and there were all the awnings and the, the Shamianas, as they're called. Anyway, they got set fire to and the pavilion burned down and we were inside it. The police came in and got everybody out. We went onto the pitch and then it was about the second day of the last test. Les Ames, who was the manager, came on and said the tour's over. They burnt the pavilion down and the ground was in tremendous unrest. Trouble was certainly following you during the early part of your career and there was more controversy to come in the 1970s. I'd love to get your take on a couple of incidents. Let's start with 1974 in Port of Spain, West Indies, again, the opposition. And this is when Tony Gregg ran out Alvin Calicharan. What did you make of that? What happened was the last ball was bowled. Alvin Calicharan walked off from the bowling end. Greggy was fielding next to the wicket at the batsman's end, picked up the ball. It hit him on the pad, came to Greggy, the, the, the last ball of the day. And Greggy, in one movement, just picked up the ball and threw it and hit the stumps at the bowler's end. And Alvin had started to walk off. Now, as the umpire hadn't called over, in technical terms, he was out. They rioted a bit then. The crowd wanted to pull Greggy's arms and legs off. And Gary Sobers came into our dressing room. He was a hero, obviously. And he said, Greggy, I think you better come out the ground in my car. So Gary actually took uh, Greggy in his car because he thought that was the best way of getting Greg out of the ground safely. Then, of course, all the powers that be met on both sides and a statement was made that Tony Gregg is not to blame in any way, but for the good of the tour, Alvin Calitran's wicket is going to be reinstated. So they put it back. And they very publicly, before the first ball was bowled, they stood in the middle of the wicket, both of them, Greggy and he, and they shook hands, and then we carried on. Tony Gregg was at the heart of that moment, and he ruffled further feathers with his infamous I intend to make them grovel comment ahead of the 1976 West Indies tour. What were your thoughts about that at the time? Greggy was a volatile person. Um, he was a tremendous competitor. He was a fabulous cricketer. He was a lovely bloke. But even he would admit that he went over the top when he said that, especially as captain, especially to uh, camera as well. When you were in there batting, all the batters said as soon as Greggy came out, he put an extra couple of yards on the pace of the bowling. And then to, to continue on the West Indies theme, you are then recalled against the West Indies at Old Trafford in 1984. So... Different opposition, but your England career has kind of come full circle. It all started at Old Trafford. And there's a gap of 86 tests between, between test appearances. How did that happen? And how did you feel to be back involved with England? I was very pleased to be. I knew that I'd had quite a consistent career, as the figures show. It wasn't a very good wicket to play against the quick bowlers on. And Michael Holding again, and Wayne Daniel bowled like lightning. I only bowled in one innings there. That's me as an off spinner, but the thing that I remember more about that test is that's the first time I played against the West Indies and got in night watchman and somebody and somebody had invented helmets. So I batted 
Holding Roberts, Daniel Croft, Garner, Marshall, Patterson, Walsh, Ambrose, <laughs> with with without a helmet, going against that lot on a fiery wicket with no helmet in '76 was very very hard to play against them in '84. I can remember being so grateful for having a having a flipping helmet to uh, to wear. As you say, you only bowled once because the West Indies won by an innings, but you did take four for 121 in the first innings including the wicket of Gordon Greenwich, who made a double century. And it was a great return to the side, especially as you were 37 by that point. Yeah. And then your final appearance for England came on the tour to India the following winter. And fittingly enough, it was another chaotic overseas tour with the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi and then the shooting of Percy Norris, the Deputy High Commissioner of Western India. This notwithstanding... Were you pleased to be on tour with England again? Oh, very pleased. Yeah, I love touring in India. The thing is about that tour, Phil Edmonds and I, we did we did all the bowling. We bowled all day, every day, in virtually every game. We're playing one test match, and there were four rather senior England supporters out watching it, and they, they were very experienced blokes, and they'd been all around the world, and they watched cricket. And one of them came up to me and said, Pat, this is, today was one of the best days cricket we've seen for a very long time. And I thought, really? Why is that? It looked, you know, quite an average day. So he said, well, when they bowl, they take uh, the, the new ball. He said, we expect the bowlers to bowl fast and aggressive. And then when the new ball is gone, he said, we want to see quality spinners bowling at quality bats. And then we want to enjoy the tussle between them. And if you think they had Gavaska, Azarudin, Kapil Dev, Jimmy Armanath, Shastri, Vensaka. I mean, a fabulous lineup. And Phil and I, we used to bowl 30, 40 overs every day. And we were able to keep control of the match because of it. That doesn't happen now. Two or three years ago, I looked at the England side. Six of them had averaged between 30 first class matches and 80 first class matches. I played 554. When I played, every single county match you played, there was a spinner who bowled 200, 300, 400, 500, occasionally even 600 first class matches. So every match you played in, you had an opportunity of watching someone bowl and learning from them. And as Dennis Lilly once said, he learned more about his bowling, having a beer with an old player after the match than he ever did on the pitch. Well, in those days, people used to mix a bit more, but every single game you played, you had an experienced bowler to help you. I had four bowlers who helped me. Initially, in the early days, I had Laker and Locke. And then later on, I had Titmus and Gibbs. Now, between them, they got 8,000 first-class <laughs> wickets. Yeah. 8,000 first-class wickets. Who have the players of today got to show them how to bowl? Let's talk about Sussex, 1972 and Eastbourne. Can we talk about that match? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Let me just set it up for you, if you don't mind. So Sussex were chasing 205 for the win, and they needed 18 from three overs with nine wickets in hand. Roger Priddo, who is also on this list, he can tell us about this incident as well. He'd already scored 100 in the first innings, and he was nearing 100 in the second innings. And then Mickey Stewart tossed you the ball. So what happened next? I can honestly say that I, I didn't bowl any better than average on that. It's just that no one played missed. Every time somebody hit the ball, it went in the air. Somebody caught it. They didn't play a miss. They nicked it or they missed a straight one. They were out LBW. But honestly, the best I've ever bowled in my life was against the West Indies on a rock hard wicket with a fantastic batting lineup with a 55 yard straight a boundary as it was at Sabina Park in those days. And I bowled 59 overs and got naught for 151. That was about as well as I've ever bowled in my life. And when I came off, every player in the dressing room came up to me to shake my hand and said, Pat, bloody well bowled, mate, of the fantastic bowling spell. Naught for 150. You try telling somebody that after, after a long, long career, the best you ever bowled, you got naught for 151. And yet I didn't, I didn't bowl any better or worse 
that I did when I took the world record of seven wickets in, in 11 balls. No, but for the record, you finished with seven for 67. You took seven wickets and 11 balls, and you lost two overs, took seven for four. Uh, so I, it just makes me laugh because it, you think, well, yeah, it's a bit of a joke. Yeah. Who was your biggest rival during your career? Oh, probably John Inbury. Ernie, as he's known as, was a fine bowler. In fact, he got more wickets than me in his career. One more. <laughs> I got a 670, he got 1,600. <laughs> I was disappointed at the wickets at the over. The wickets at the over were the, possibly the worst in the country. To start off with, they were like bird seed. It was the lowest, slowest wicket you could ever bowl on. And then it, when they relayed the wickets, they didn't ever turn. In fact, we, one year we played two matches on exactly the same wicket. And even Intercab, a leg spinner, at the end of the sixth day, still hard, uh, hardly turned the ball. Throughout my career, the only thing that I was a bit, a bit disappointed in was to having to play all your home games on such rubbish wickets for a spinner because they were, they were absolutely terrible either low and slow or rock hard, a bit like playing on a West Indian wicket. Who was the best captain to play under? Oh, Mike Brearley. Mike Brearley, without a doubt. But the person, actually, it's rather strange, the person who I enjoyed playing a test match with more than any other was David Gower. Because when I played under David, I'd been playing for years. I was 38 years of age. I had 500 first-class matches to, to my list. He never argued with anything. Occasionally, setting a field, he'd say, what's this man for? And I would say, and I would explain what he, what he was there for. He said, okay. But only probably three times in the whole tour, I'd set the field. And because when you're 38 and you've played 500 matches, you've got a pretty good idea where you, best, where you should have the fielders. I spent more time thinking about my bowling in a month than some people did over our bowling, over placing fields for our spinners in their whole career. So yeah. I didn't want anyone to overrule me. And the captain can obviously always overrule you. But, but, but David, I enjoyed playing under David Gower so much because he told me when he wanted me to bowl. And once I came on to bowl, he didn't argue with anything. What was your favourite ground? Love, okay. love playing at Worcester. I mean, such a beautiful ground with the cathedral in the background. In fact, I can remember about the year before I was captain and the year before I packed up. It's a lovely, beautiful, sunny day and I'm fielding down at Fine Lake and there's two guys that are sitting there in a deck chair. And it was about quarter past five in the evening and I thought when I pack up playing cricket I'm going to come down and I'm going to sit in deck chairs there so I said this looks about as good as it possibly gets. Let's leave Pat there on his deck chair at Worcester looking back on his fantastic career that spanned three different decades and took in the Caribbean, India and Pakistan. Remembering his first test wicket the future West Indies World Cup winning captain Clive Lloyd seven wickets and 11 balls against Sussex in 1972, and what an Ashes debut, six for 79 in that second innings at Old Trafford, the wickets of Cowper, Walters, Sheehan, Jarman, Hawke, and Ian Chappell. I tried to get Pocock out of the ground. We were trying to, we were pushing on trying to get quick runs, and I think I hit Pat for six, and then I hit him straight up in the air. In fact, I think Noddy might have caught it. Ian was back in 1972, this time as captain, and he came into contact with Pat again. I remember Pat, 72, we were at the Oval playing Surrey. We were at a, an official function and I only had one beer that night and normally I'd have, you know, half a dozen. And I remember Ray Steele, the manager, I said to Ray, are you going back now to the hotel? And he said, yeah. I said, I'm coming with you. And we were sitting in the taxi going back to the hotel. I said to him, I badly need 100 tomorrow. And the night before, I was a few not out, I reckon, and Pat bowled the last over of the day. And he put all the field right around the bat. 
And I thought, fuck this. Um, if he thinks I'm just going to block out the over. And I, and I mean, I wasn't a big one for hitting down the ground. But I hit him over the top. I can't remember whether it went for four or six. I think it probably only went for four because I wasn't a great hitter of, you know, shots down the ground. But it was just like, you're not going to dominate me, even though it's the last over. Anyhow, I got the 100 the next day. More from Ian in the weeks to come. If you want to see the photo of Pat and Basil Dolivera following their bowling and batting exploits at Old Trafford in 1968, then visit the website onceuponatimeintheashes.com or connect with me on Twitter at onceashes. Next time out, it's our Wicketkeeper special with Brian Tabor ready and waiting behind the stumps. Until then, I've been Graham Barrett and this has been Once Upon a Time in the Ashes. (laughs) 